on behalf of the faculty, staff, and administration of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, welcome to UMBC's 2008 Convocation. Please rise for our national anthem, performed by a group of our talented students. Gentlemen, please remove your caps or hats during the anthem. Please be seated. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Diane Lee, UMBC's Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education. In her role, Dr. Lee oversees the development and operation of programs that enrich the undergraduate education experience. Such examples include the introduction to an honors university course, the Learning Resource Center, the Women's Center, and Undergraduate Research and Creative Achievement Day. A 1997 presidential teaching professor, Dr. Lee is a faculty member in the Department of Education and has worked at UMBC for over 20 years. Please welcome Dr. Lee to the podium. Good afternoon. Let's try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to UMBC. The poet Wallace Stevens writes about six significant landscapes. Each landscape describes a way of being in the world. In the sixth landscape, that is the last stanza, Stevens asks us to let go of certainty, to reach beyond our comfort zone, and to be willing to break down the barriers that separate us one from the other. The last stanza reads as follows. Rationalists wearing square hats think in square rooms, looking at the floor, looking at the ceiling. They confine themselves to right-angled triangles. If they tried rhomboids, cones, waving lines, ellipses, as for example the ellipse of the half moon, rationalists would wear sombreros. In this verse, Stevens is suggesting that we reject the limits of rationalism and implicitly any ideology that would confine our ways of knowing the world and interacting with one another. Indeed, he encourages us to look afar, beyond the boundaries suggested by science, language, culture, age, race, and the like. Indeed, by letting go of squares and right-angle triangles, the 
suggestion is that we can and should be open to one another, to new ideas, and to all kinds of experiences. It is important to note that Stevens is not insisting that we give up our beliefs or abandon altogether our long-held explanations of people and things. In fact, Stevens is asking only that we be interested in what someone else believes, that we listen, and we seek to understand ideas different from our own, and, at the same time, that we assert a willingness to have our thoughts, our beliefs, and our opinions challenged. This is not easy to do. It really is not easy to do. It is difficult to call into question that which we hold true. Importantly, in Stephen's verse, it is not sufficient to doubt or to question alone. Rather, he calls upon us to recapture the joy, the excitement, and actually the sheer delight of discovery, much the way a child would do. But to do so, we must look at those things that are familiar as if we were seeing them for the very first time and allow our emotions to be aroused by the things we know as well as by the things that remain mysterious. If Wallace Stevens were here today, I'm sure he would ask all of us to set ourselves free of any self-imposed limits and mind-numbing restrictions. He would remind us that it's okay to be disturbed, to be perplexed, and even confused at times, because it is often in those moments that we dream, that we embrace curiosity, and that we give rein to our imagination. So today, you're going to hear from many of us, and I think one theme that you will hear is that we're going to encourage you to playfully, willingly, and even proudly wear a sombrero. By doing so, you will create a thoughtful and enlightening and exciting landscape for yourselves while you're here at UMBC. Again, welcome to UMBC. I am really very pleased and most honored to be able to introduce to you the president of UMBC, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, and he will introduce our new provost, Elliot Hirschman. Yes, welcome him. <laughs> Thank you. We are here today because of you. You see faculty here. Would you give the faculty a hand, faculty and staff a hand? And students, what I want you to know as, as fellow students, we're all students, is that faculty and staff are not required to be here. They wanted to be here to let you know that you are welcome. And so as you listen today, I want you to appreciate the fact that you are in a community where people standing up here, sitting here, some in the audience are here just to let you know you're not alone, that there are others here to support you. I will be speaking later, but I'm delighted now to introduce our provost, who is the chief academic officer. He is senior vice president and provost, and his background makes a very important point to you about education. Because what you will see is that you will have many opportunities to do all kinds of things. As an undergraduate at Yale, he studied mathematics and economics. In graduate school, he studied psychology at U University of California, Los Angeles. He was chief research officer until recently at George Washington and had been a professor and administrator at Chapel Hill and University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. Please join me. He's welcome. You are a part of the same class. He's new to UMBC too, Dr. Elliot Hirschman. Thank you, thank you Freeman, for those kind words. And thank you, Diane, for those inspiring words. Uh, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to UMBC's academic community. Convocation is a special time, a time of great promise and we're extremely excited for you to join us. Each new academic year opens up a world of possibilities. Sitting among us today are future leaders in the arts, business, education, engineering, human services, law, medicine, politics, science, and many, many other fields. These future leaders will join the ranks of UMBC graduates <coughs> like the Honorable Adrian Jones 
Speaker Pro Tem of the Maryland House of Delegates, and Stephanie Real, Chief Information Officer of the Johns Hopkins University, and Reed Thompson, Vice Chairman of Neurosurgery at Vanderbilt University. Many of you will continue the tradition, the UMBC tradition, of creating innovative career paths. You will follow in the footsteps of alumni like Kerry Bernstein, who has created a performance art group, and Sheila Lopez, who earned an MFA from Yale and formed a theater company, and Katie Hirsch, who is a video game designer and an adjunct faculty member here. Our goal as a university is to work with you so that whatever path you choose to follow, you'll be successful. To introduce you to our academic program, I wish to speak briefly about the cornerstone of our approach, an education in the liberal arts and sciences. This approach, which you'll become quite familiar with, consists of two components. The first component is a broad general education that presents multiple disciplines and perspectives such as those Dean Lee alluded to. This will include courses in the arts, humanities, social sciences, quantitative sciences, and physical sciences. The second component is a focus major that helps prepare you for graduate school and professional employment. We offer a broad range of major across the arts, engineering and information technology, humanities, social sciences, and sciences, and we've recently introduced a number of new programs in aging studies, media and communication studies, public health, and science education. By combining the broad general education and the focus major, we hope to help you become future leaders who will think critically and creatively, who will contribute to our economic growth and prosperity, and who will collaborate with diverse groups. These abilities are more important today and more important for you to pursue as the world faces a range of pressing political, medical, environmental, and social problems. Given these challenges, I note for you that it's not a coincidence that the word liberal in the phrase liberal arts and sciences and the word liberate to set free share the same Latin root, liberare. In this way, our goal is for your liberal arts and sciences education to liberate and empower you to move forward in a leadership role as you leave UMBC. With this important goal in mind, we look forward to supporting you in the coming years as you develop as a thinker and as an engaged member of our community. Again, welcome and best wishes. We're glad you're here. It's now my pleasure to introduce Steve Gilmore, President of the Student Government Association. Steve is a brother of Pi Kappa Phi and a member of the Mama's Boys, UMBC's first and only all-male a cappella group. He is a Linehan Artist Scholar, majoring in music education, and expects to graduate in May 2009. Upon graduation, Steve hopes to pursue graduate study in public policy or higher education administration. Please join me in welcoming Steve to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Hirschman. Dr. Rabowski, faculty, staff, and fellow students. My name is Steve Gilmore, and I am a senior majoring in music education. It is an honor to be speaking to you all today as the president of the Student Government Association a member of the Mama's Boys a cappella group, a brother of Pi Kappa Phi fraternity, and an orientation peer advisor. You are about to begin a new chapter in your lives, and frankly, I'm a little jealous. I did not know what to expect from UMBC when I entered as a freshman. My main concern coming in was not my classes, my room, or the food. It was fitting in. Just like many of you, I was entering a completely different community for the first time in my life. At Rising Sun High School, a small countryside school with students of similar backgrounds, I was very involved in sports, music, and other extracurricular activities. 
but I definitely was not an outgoing social person. It was uncomfortable for me to put myself out there, and instead, I often disappeared into the crowd, as some of you could imagine. You will hear from Aditi later on about how she didn't have a plan coming to UMBC, but I definitely had an agenda coming here. One of the groups I really wanted to join was the UMBC Mama's Voice. Within the first few weeks of the semester, I auditioned for the group, not knowing what to expect. I was overwhelmed singing in front of 18 college guys and being drilled with questions. Although I felt like giving up at times, I wanted to overcome my old high school habit. I did not want to be afraid to show the kind of person I am. After finally getting in, one of the mama's boys told me, your undergraduate career is no longer an ordinary one. Now, this did not mean that you had to be a mama's boy to be a extraordinary, and at least I'm not interpreting it that way. Uh, but he was right. I had a core group of good friends from high school, but after joining the group, after a first few weeks, I had made better friends in the time I uh, spent the past four years. From there, some of the guys connected me with things like SGA, Greek life, admissions, and orientation. All I needed to do was step outside of my comfort zone. We all have our walls and boundaries, but instead of waiting for a reason to do something, ask why not. What's the worst that can happen? Let's say you sign up for the robotic dance club. You go to the first meeting, you find out you hate robotic dance just like the person sitting next to you. You find a few other friends and a faculty member to advise you, and together you form the anti-robotic dance club. You laugh now, but it could happen. Having been an orientation peer advisor for the past three years, first year students and their families often ask me, what do you like most about UMBC? Even now, I sometimes have trouble answering that question. You see, UMBC is not a place you can give a hug or shake hands with. When I think about what I like about this place, I think about the people who are part of this community. I think about the faculty. When one professor took our choir, the Camerata, to Carnegie Hall two years ago, but was even able to get us free ice cream from a random stand in New York. I think about the advisors who take the concept of academic advising past this course registration to finding out what students value in their education. I think about my fellow SGA members in the crowd, as well as the SEB members in the Woolies. Guys, raise your hands. All right. These people are here because they want to make sure that you have the best experience at UMBC. Many of them right now are wearing blue wristbands, signifying that they are committing to your first year experience. Here is some advice your fellow students wanted me to give you. Keep an open mind. Have fun, but stay focused. Go to a random event per week that you think you won't like. Leave time for, your, for yourself. And finally, know that we will always be here for you when you need help. Finally, I want to emphasize the number of leadership opportunities that are available at UMBC. You'll hear from Dr. Rabowski that everyone is in this room because you are smart. I agree, but I also know that everyone is in this room because you have the potential to be involved and make a difference on this campus. Many of you will be leaders in research during your undergraduate career. Others may lead in service by volunteering through the Shriver Center. You also have a chance to be involved in one of our 200 student organizations and perhaps become an officer. All of you have what is necessary to do great things here, and it is up to you to act on those opportunities. As you leave the rack today, remember to rub the nose on the statue of True Grit. This is a tradition followed by previous first year students as a sign of good luck for their time at UMBC. As you do, Think about how you want to leave your mark at UMBC. I never imagined that I would go from singing in front of 18 college guys to standing here speaking to 1,800 people. Who knows? You may find yourself here in three years welcoming the new incoming class. Thank you, and welcome to UMBC. One of our traditions at UMBC is to invite the current presidential teaching recipient to address new students at convocation. This award 
honoring exemplary dedication and achievements, is given to just one faculty member each year. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Timmy Topoleski, a professor in mechanical engineering and recipient of the 2008 Presidential Teaching Award. Dr. Topoleski has distinguished himself as an outstanding scholar and mentor whose engaging teaching has touched and inspired many students at UMBC. And for those who remember orientation as the panda guy, Dr. Topoleski. Thank you. I'll tell you, this is really cool. Yeah, this is great. I feel like I know so many of you. I've already given you one class, right? So, Dr. Hrabowski, Dr. Hirschman, my fellow faculty, staff, and students. This is really a remarkable honor for me. One, I can't really imagine repeating, but you know, if you're fortunate to have two of something, then you have a set. And when you have three or more, that becomes a collection. And I am a collector. Although my wife, Marcy, uses different words and phrases like, that pile of stuff is getting out of hand, or how many of those things do we really need come to mind? But I'm in good company. Uh, we know some of UMBC's best friends, for example, the Meyerhoffs, are enthusiastic collectors of art and supporters of the arts. Collections and collecting bring people together and help us learn about ourselves. When I teach, I often share items from my collections. I've used examples of African art for, for the Honors College Forum and some of my crystals and ancient ceramics in my biomaterials and material science classes and stamps in my orientation classes. This summer, I realized I had another collection, not of objects, but of experiences. I, like many of you, have been fortunate to visit places where the world was changed forever. So maybe you've been to places significant to the world's religions, like Jerusalem or Mecca. I've been to places in China to see the roots of Taoism and Confucianism. I've been to Wittenberg, Germany, and touched the door where Martin Luther posted his 95 theses that started the Reformation. In that same trip, I visited, visited the Thomas Kirche in Leipzig, where Bach changed music forever. I lived in Philadelphia, and each time I visited Independence Hall or even one of the historic taverns, I was moved by the story of the young United States. And you know, less than one hour's drive from UMBC, we can visit Gettysburg and Washington, D.C., and consider the world-shaking changes that occurred there. This summer, I was able to add to my collection and visit another place where the world was changed forever. And I want you to imagine this. Imagine a wind-swept, desert-like stretch of land. The site was marked by four tall white stones, about the size of this podium. They were designated only by the numbers one, two, three, and four. And as I approached with my seven-year-old daughter, Eliza, holding my hand, I stopped and I was frozen by the significance of where we stood. My daughter turned to me and said, why are you crying, Daddy? And I told her, because this is a place where the world was changed forever. So my family stayed in the shade as I walked 852 feet to the stone with the number four. I did that alone on the sand, in the heat, in the wind. You'll see it's an engineering thing. I wish I had known as I stood there these words of Leonardo da Vinci. There shall be wings. If the accomplishment be not for me, tis for some other. The spirit cannot die, and we shall have wings. See, I was in Kitty Hawk on the outer banks of North Carolina, where Orville and Wilbur Wright made their historic first four flights. I had visited there before, but not with my family, and that was significant. See, my daughters are from the People's Republic of China, and what so moved me on this visit was feeling a personal connection between the world-changing events of Kitty Hawk and the flights that made it possible for me and my wife to travel to China to be with our little girls and change our lives forever. The Wright brothers' very inspiring story is certainly relevant here at UMBC. The Wright brothers didn't just come up with a good idea, build a plane, and then make history. They worked on flight for over seven years. So if you think four years of college is a long time, think of that. They failed miserably more than once, and several times declared they were finished, and even predicted that flight would not be achieved in their lifetime. But you know what? It wasn't in their nature to give up. They held fast to their vision of flight, and on December 17, 1903, they did what many people said could not be done. Imagine what it was like on that cold, windy, wintry day. How desolate the Outer Banks must have been without, say, brew throughs or the surf shops, you know? The spirit is captured perfectly by five words on a plaque at the site. They taught us to fly. And once they taught us to fly, flight literally took off. You know, sometimes those old cliches are great. Within seven years, there were three airfields on Long Island, and a short eight years later, in 1911, 
Harriet Quimby became the first woman to earn a pilot certificate. In 1921, Bessie Coleman was the first African-American man or woman to receive a pilot's license. And in 1969, 66 years, barely a lifetime later, human beings walked on the moon. The next time you get in an airplane, remember that it was the combination of vision and hard work that changed our world and makes it possible for you to travel to exotic places for spring break when you get older, all right? And for me and my family to visit my daughter's birth country and for Dr. Hrabowski to bring the UMBC success stories all over the world. And it's amazing where I encounter some of the UMBC success stories. You know, today is a very special day in our family because it's my youngest daughter, Audrey's first day of kindergarten. <laughs> no, thank you. You know, last week, during her classroom preview, I discovered that one of her classmates is the daughter of a UMBC mechanical engineering graduate, Monica Rodriguez, who I taught 10 years ago and has been working at Northrop Grumman since graduation. On our vacation to the Outer Banks, I was able to catch a quick visit with some other former and current UMBC students who were staying only a mile or so away from us. The first student who recognized me, because I must have looked like the pizza delivery guy, was a Zenith Palmer, an English and French major at UMBC that I had the pleasure and privilege to teach in 2003 when I co-taught the Humanities Scholars Seminar with my colleague Jay Fryman from the Ancient Studies Department. Asina is now working on her PhD in English at the University of Michigan. I was surprised to learn that her fiance, and he was in the pool at the time, is Harry Malecki, who was a mechanical engineering major at UMBC. Harry is now working at Northrop Grumman and working on his graduate degree here at UMBC. And as I sat with my feet in the water catching up with our UMBC graduate successes, I had a chance to reflect a little bit on my own academic history. I was inspired by my parents and grandparents. My mother was the first in her family to go to college and earn her RN. My father was the first and only person in his family to go to college, a remarkable achievement when you consider that his father, my grandfather, was a coal miner who died in a mining collapse when my dad was only 14. My grandmother spoke very little English. They lived in the little coal mining town of Ashley, Pennsylvania, at the end of the street next to the New Jersey Central Railroad tracks. But not only did my father emerge from that experience to go to college, but he earned his PhD and became a college professor. And so university life was in my blood. I rarely lived more than walking distance from a major university. I remember that I was in second grade when I knew, I knew that I was gonna be a college professor. I don't know how I knew, I just knew it. But when I started my college education, like some of you, I wasn't sure what I would study. It was a family friend who suggested that my interest in math, physics, and biology that would, would, would merge with this emerging field of bioengineering. That might be the place for me. See, Cornell had no bioengineering program at the time, so I actually had to design my own curriculum through an interdisciplinary studies program. And I worked in industry for a year or so after I graduated and then returned to Cornell and earned a Master of Engineering degree. I continued in my studies and then I hit a wall. I ran into trouble with my advisors during my PhD program and boy, do I wish I had known the Wright Brothers story then. It, might have been a good idea to give up my silly second grader's dream of becoming a professor. But my parents, and once again a special mentor, believed in me, and I made a change in both my university and my area of study. Like the Wright brothers, I could not accept anything less than success. And it was then, when my life changed forever, I made it my goal to be a professor that cared about my students' successes. And that led me here to UMBC. It's the spirit and values embodied in all aspects of our campus that allowed me to, to make a forever change and become the professor I wanted to be. And I wanna ask you now, are you ready to change forever? Because your experience and successes here at UMBC will lead to a forever change. You'll add it to your collection. One experience that convinced me of this was the, was the 20th anniversary celebration of our Meyerhoff program last spring. The alumni hosts of the evening were both former UMBC mechanical engineering majors, now married to each other, Brian Wayman and Nika Warwick, who received their PhDs at Georgia Tech. Brian worked in my lab as an undergrad, and I continue to be so proud as Brandon Johnson, one of the undergraduates who currently works in my lab, presented the student's gift to Mr. Meyerhoff. But what struck me as I looked around at all the people who had been touched by the program, as I saw what had been accomplished by vision and hard work at UMBC, was that now I was involved in events that were changing the world, not just visiting a place. I was awestruck. It became clear to me as I watched the documentary on the history of the Meyerhoff program that Mr. Meyerhoff and President Horowski created the program not to enhance anyone's reputation, but to enable students to succeed. I knew I was in the right place. And I want all of you to know that you are in the right place now. You know, we know that Harvard, Cornell, Georgia Tech, University of Michigan, 
University of Pennsylvania, where I finally got my degree, they all had reputations of excellence before UMBC was even founded. And maybe you chose UMBC over those places. You know, we don't do here what we do to compete with Harvard, although, you know, we, cover, we uh, kick their ivy covered you know what's in chess. You guys know that? And in basketball, and in cross, Coach Monroe, Coach Zimmerman. Uh, yeah, give them a hand. That's a good. We know that you, our students, are smart, but I want you, our students, to know something as well, that the UMBC faculty, staff, and administrators that you see are very good at what they do. What we do at UMBC is to give you more than just a place to earn an education. We are giving you the opportunity to excel. That's what makes us an honors university, not just get by, but to excel. You need to exceed what you thought was possible. Realize and believe that you have chosen to come to UMBC, and you will now be part of changing the world. You know, as a reminder of this, the Meyerhoff scholars at UMBC are constantly reciting Langston Hughes' poem, Dreams, and it goes like this. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. The poet tells us what happens if we allow our dreams and goals to slip away. And it paints a pretty, pretty bleak picture, don't you think? The poem does not tell us what will happen if you do keep your dreams and goals in sight, and if you're successful. How do we convey those feelings? What are our images of success? You know, think about it. I'm sure that many of you watch some of the Olympic Games, right? Yeah, you watch them, right? So what's, what's success? Is it victory celebrations in the pool or in the sand? Is it a gold medal? I don't know, maybe. But I don't think those images are nearly as powerful as Langston Hughes' images of losing your dreams. So how do we portray that feeling of triumph? Do we simply invert the language? You know, if dreams go, well, the opposite of go is stay. So can we say something like, if dreams stay, life is a golden field covered with hay. Okay, not quite, but work with me here, okay? If dreams <laughs> die, okay, Shakespeare talked about death, right? To be or not to be. The opposite of not to be is to be. So if dreams will be, life is a teaching career at UMBC. There you go. Okay, I know, I know. I came up with those at around two or three in the morning after the Olympics and my poetry is a little rusty. Maybe one of my literary colleagues like Dr. Robert DeLuty or Michael Fallon or Manil Suri can give it a go. But, okay, one more try, let me give one more try. You know, something like, if dreams are unfurled, we can change the world, but nah, there's no imagery or images of success in those words, right? It's a challenge. And so we have a big job ahead of us. And I ask you, are you ready to face that challenge and change forever? We are challenging you to be ready for success. Specifically, I want to challenge you to two things. It's your homework assignment for the day. First, I want you to write your own ending for Langston Hughes' poem. Create an image of the triumph that occurs when we work hard to fulfill our dreams. And remember, it's got to rhyme, OK? <laughs> Second, live your own ending to Mr. Hughes' poem by working hard toward your dreams and goals here at UMBC. Take advantage of UMBC's challenges and opportunities. Take classes outside of your major. Find a mentor and work on a research project. Go to see the theater productions and basketball games and symphony and swimming and chess and start now. It's here for you. You know, on a, an observer on that December day watched Wilbur shake Orville's hand as he prepared to take the first flight and remarked that we couldn't help notice how they held on to each other's hands, sort of like two folks parting who weren't sure they'd ever see each other again. But I hold to a different interpretation. The brothers were not anticipating failure. They had worked hard, and I think they knew absolutely that their dream was about to become real, and they were about to change the world. And you need to know that now. At UMBC, you can exceed what you thought was possible. You need to know that your successes here at UMBC will lead to a forever change. We will help each other hold fast to our dreams and work hard to be successful. And so in conclusion, I ask you, since classes start tomorrow, are you ready for success? Are you ready for success? Thank you. So I want to give you my best wishes for a successful academic year. Thank you for your kind attention, and welcome to UMBC. Thank you. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Aditi Srivastav, who will share the benefits of getting involved in activities and organizations on campus. Aditi is a sophomore Sondheim Public Affairs Scholar and a member of the Honors College. She's a varsity cheerleader, a published author of a scientific research paper, and the leader of several school spirit initiatives. Please join me in welcoming Aditi.
Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. My name is Aditi Shravastav. I'm a Sondheim scholar. I'm a varsity cheerleader. I'm an SGA senator. I'm a UMBC ambassador. And I'm absolutely sick with retriever fever. But it wasn't actually always that way. When I started talking about college with my family, I had envisioned going to school on the West Coast. I was looking for new people, new mindsets, a profound experience, and strongly believed that leaving Maryland was the only way I was going to find it. Growing up in Maryland all of my life, I figured that I'd finally get my strong desire for independence and a big change. My parents, however, disagreed, and we decided that UMBC would give me everything that I was looking for. And so I found myself sitting in the same seats that all of you are sitting in today, daydreaming about California. In retrospect, I find that daydreaming blinded me from seeing all that UMBC had to offer. Unlike Steve, I was extremely involved in high school and I was very social and you, most of you know I love to talk. From SGA, community service, you name it, I was in it. And I always had a plan. I knew where I wanted to be, who I wanted to be, and what I wanted to do. But when I came to UMBC, I found myself with no plan. Opportunities came and I let them pass. Very quickly I began to feel extremely lonely as I realized that attending scholarship events, going to class, and hanging out with friends did not suffice. I realized that disconnecting myself from campus was doing me a lot of harm. I knew I had to change my outlook and I decided to get involved. I got involved with varsity cheerleading, which was the best experience of my freshman year. Cheering at every basketball game, attending the America East tournaments with the crazy fans in our rack, showed me that there was a lot I didn't know about UMBC. Slowly but surely, I was connecting with UMBC's campus. I always had professors, students, staff, and even Dr. Robowski himself reaching out to help me when I needed it. The open door approach at UMBC helped in the journey to identifying myself with the school and getting more involved. Still, I was waiting for that self-confirmation that I had made the best decision to attend UMBC. Everyone around me seemed to know it, but why couldn't I figure it out? One day, I found my defining moment. I lived on the Shriver Living and Learning community my freshman year where all of us had shared a passion of community service. I had the privilege of working at an after-school center in West Baltimore. So one afternoon, a kindergartner invited me over to the broken sidewalk for a round of jump rope. I giggled to myself when I realized that the only time I could remember a jumping rope was when Velcro shoes were still in. After I sat down to rest, she stared, looked straight into my eyes, and asked me, are you Hawaiian? Because your eyelashes are dark blue. I tried not to show my shock as it was just eye makeup and I was trying something new. No one had ever doubted my Indian heritage. When I told her that my parents were Indian, she replied, I've never seen an Indian before. Do they all have blue eyelashes? <laughs> what I initially perceived as ignorance turned out to be oblivion. She knew nothing outside of her life in Baltimore. And on the ride home that day, I began to realize that I had come to UMBC just as sheltered. We were similar people in different circumstances. I thought I knew everything about Maryland, including what UMBC would be like, because I had lived here all my life. But I had based my assumptions from a part of Maryland that I had lived in. By definition, you could say that me and her were diverse, being minorities. But I found that being different was not the answer to understanding diversity in our world and in our communities. I could not have come to this conclusion outside of my UMBC experience. UMBC is a place where diversity is not limited to ethnicity, but also includes ideologies and interests. UMBC's open atmosphere allows you to question the status quo and your own personal assumptions. It is a school where I can talk about things that most people avoid. It is a school where I can set my own traditions and have people follow. And it is a school that stands out from the rest of Maryland. So, looking back to my ideal college experience, I found that UMBC has everything that I was ever asking for, and I didn't need to travel 3,000 miles away to find it. While you're creating your own identity, you're helping UMBC create its own. While you're learning about yourself and other people, you're letting others do the same. So, get involved. Show UMBC who you are. Don't let small things get in the way of making the most of your college experience, because before you know it, four years are up, and you'll look back and wonder, what could I have done instead of, look, this is what I did. The things I'm involved in aren't even half the things that UMBC has to offer. We have hundreds of more to choose from, and if you can't find what you want, you can make it. I have no doubt that all of you will do wonderfully here, and I'm ecstatic to meet all of you. I look forward to this upcoming year.
Class of 2012, welcome to UMBC. I hope to see you at our games around campus in class involved in taking part of all the action. And just as a warning, we are all highly contagious. I wouldn't be surprised if you came down with a case of retriever fever as well. Thank you so much. You made the best choice. I am now honored to introduce the president of UMBC, Dr. Freeman Robowski. Dr. Robowski has served as president since 1992, bringing great energy, vision, and leadership to this institution. He has helped connect the university with companies, foundations, agencies, and individuals who have helped us launch and sustain such programs such as the Sondheim Public Affairs Scholars, Linehan Artist Scholars, and Meyerhoff Scholars programs. Dr. Robowski is also known for taking a personal interest in all UMBC students. Don't be surprised if he stops you while you're walking or in an elevator and asks you what grade you earned on your last exam. He is devoted to ensuring that all students reach their goals and achieve their potential. In fact, I am delighted that Dr. Robowski is my mentor. Please join me in welcoming our president, Dr. Freeman Robowski. Can I tell him you've been through a major challenge, or would you not rather that I not? Um, I won't then. I won't. Okay. Uh, I am so proud of Aditi. Would you give her a big hand, please? I'm very proud of her. <laughs> Yesterday, many of you participated in our new book, book experience involving Jeanette Wall's memoir, The Glass Castle. I had the privilege of taking part in one of those discussions where students from many different backgrounds talked about their reactions to the book. It was fascinating to listen to student reactions, uh, thinking about the challenges that all of those children faced, and to see how the different reactions were shaped by the stories and the childhood experiences of the students in the room. The book, like your college experience, was meant to stretch you intellectually and personally to take you, as many have said today, beyond your comfort zone to explore new ideas, to meet new people. Who could have imagined a set of parents like Rex and Rosemary allowing a three-year-old child, a baby, to boil water, to fix hot dogs, to be burned, and then to act as if it's no big deal? So what students said yesterday was just how angry they became, as we all did, how frustrating the experience was as we thought about these people, but how complicated the situation was because there was love there, and yet there were some challenges there, emotional, psychological. What was interesting was that as disturbing as this story is, we learn a lot about by examining it, by knowing how others have lived, in fact, the challenges they faced. We get a chance to see something about the values they hold or don't hold, we get a chance to think about how to put our own lives in perspective. Today, you've been hearing from faculty and students about their experiences at UMBC, and it's very interesting that when I talked with my uh, students yesterday, I asked them what I should say today, and they said, say something inspiring, say something about stories. Uh, they even said, try to keep it real, say something that people can really relate to. And then somebody said something absolutely fascinating. She said, tell them how you love to learn. Tell them how you love learning itself. It was fascinating to hear her say that. And so we come today to tell you, yes, to get beyond your comfort zone, to get involved from the arts to the athletics. Give that basketball, lacrosse, and swimming and diving teams a big hand. Those are all championships. We're very proud of all of them. There is no doubt that all of you are somewhat anxious. Is there anybody, any new student in the room who isn't a little worried, just a little worried? How many of you are a little worried at least, a little or a lot worried at this point? It's only human, it's only natural. I want my colleagues, faculty and staff to remember the day before your first class in college. Now for some of us it's 20 years, for some of us, for me it's over 40 years. And the first thought, I was trying to do that as I sat here. My, my entire speech that's written will be on the web. You can read it. I'm just going to talk a few minutes and we'll finish. But the, 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 I thought about, I said, let me try to remember what it felt like right before my first day of college. And, and I couldn't help but think, well, I, yeah, I missed my parents. Um, 
I thought I was smarter than I was. Um, I could see a lot of smart people in the room. One big difference, students, one really major difference was everybody in my freshman class looked just like me. It hadn't occurred to me until I looked out and saw all of you representing families in Maryland, all over the, from all over the country, families whose roots go to all over the world. And when I was a freshman, while I loved being around people like myself, I really was curious. I wanted to know, what would it be like to sit next to people different from me? And I often thought, would, the question was, well, would it ever be the case that I would sit in class with people who were different? It never occurred to me that I would be standing here today as president of a place like this. Because when I was growing up, I couldn't even go in the door of a place like this in my home state in Alabama. That's how different the world is. You are a part of the new America. You have roots that come from all over the world. You are smart. You are excited about the work. You have a lot to learn, and I'm sure you know that. And I challenge you to think about what it means to prepare for your futures. The first point would be, number one, it's hard to believe how far you will go. If you ask any faculty or staff member here, probably except Tim Tabulowski, who knew he was going to be a college professor. Most people had no clue what they were going to do. So don't feel badly if you don't know what you want to do. Some of you know what you're going to do, and you probably will change your minds. It's OK. That's the value of a liberal education. You have an opportunity to explore the possibilities. But you are here not simply to get a job. Of course, you'll get a good job. That'll be fine. You're not just here to get a degree. If you want to go to grad school, you'll do that. But you really are here to prepare for life to learn how to learn and how to live. And part of your preparation involves learning how to express yourselves with authenticity, saying what you honestly think or believe, being able to speak and to write, to think clearly, but not saying simply what we want you to say, but saying what you really do believe to be the truth. Part of your challenge will be to listen to other points of view, points of view that may make you angry, but to be able to listen carefully, to agree sometimes to disagree. The biggest challenge I think you'll face, and you'll appreciate this, is being able to listen to different people sitting and standing and talking. It takes discipline to be able just to listen to decide what you like and what you don't like. And that's a major part of what you'll be doing for the rest of your lives. But to be able to hear it, to analyze it, to think about it, to be able to speak, and then to write what you really believe, and then to deal with the sticky issues of the day, whether it's about global warming or stem cell research or national immigration policies or the difference between the haves and the have-nots or what it means to be an American in a global economy where India and China have put a billion people into the workforce. The book that I would recommend to all of you that you might find fascinating is The Elephant and the Dragon, which talks about how all of us will be different as a result of these major economies and what they will mean as different jobs move to other parts of the world. The challenge that we will face is to produce leaders across disciplines who can think creatively and, cr and critically as we work to build an economy when things will be dramatically different today from 20 years from now or 20 years before. Watch this. How many of you have always, how many people in the room, watch and see who raises a hand, folks. How many people in the room can remember when your house got its first television? Look to your right and your left, all right? All of you, and most of you are saying you always had television in your house, right? Most of us perhaps did not. How many remember the first color television? Most of you would say, wasn't, color, wasn't TV always in color? No. It was something called black and white, and they were not talking about the races, right? But notice they only began talking about black and white when color came in. Before that, it was just TV. Remember that, right? How many remember the first computer in your house? Some of you, but others would say almost all your lives, all right? How many remember when you saw your first iPhone, all right? All right, now we're getting somewhere, okay? 
Well, all of your children will laugh at any of that because the world, how many of you remember a time when there was no cell phone? In a few years, everybody will know. I mean, there, there will never have been a How many of you have cell phones now? How many of you, when you were in college, had nobody with a cell phone? Right? I remember a futurist on my campus talking about people walking around with a phone. And I laughed because I was so smart. And I said, that could never happen because we'll never have cords long enough. <laughs> right? Right? That's how different the world is. What is the point I'm making? That change is inevitable. And while we are delighted that some of you are going to be doctors and scientists, for all of you, if you talk about being broadly educated, we are talking about the importance of the arts and the humanities and the social sciences to put your experiences in perspective, because you will live in a world that is very different, very different from today. And so we can't teach you everything you need to know. What we can do is give you an approach to life. This is the most important thing I can say today. This is why people have said, stay beyond your comfort zone. Get beyond your comfort zone. Learn to work and understand cultures and religions from all over the world, because you will live all over the world. You know, one of the commencement speakers some years ago, who was the head of NASA, Goddard, said, your generation will have the opportunity to leave this world in order to work. Now, for 20th century Americans, leaving this world means it's over, right? You're dead. But for your generation, not only will you work in other parts of the world, there's a great possibility you may have just that kind of chance. That's how different the world will be. And so it won't just be the science and engineering you need to know. You really need to know how to think critically. You need to know how to live richly and how to Think about what it means to be a human being. You know, curiosity will be at the core of what we ask you to do. I. I. Robbie and Nobel laureate said that when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' parents would ask the question, what did you learn in school today? He said, but not my Jewish mother. My Jewish mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And that practice of encouraging my curiosity, he said, made all the difference in the world. Well, we want you to ask us good questions, to push yourselves, and to build your relationships with other students. Much of your education involves getting to know each other. How many of you know at least 10 people in the room among your students who didn't come from your own high school? Good, very good, very good. Get to know people. How many of you know 10 people who are different from you in geography, race, ethnicity, and those kinds of things already? Keep getting to know people different from yourselves. And then look at the faculty on the left and the right. You see them? Get to know them. They're smart people. They really are. And they're nice people. They really are. But they have very high standards. Somebody yesterday said, talk about the community of standards. If you, are, if you get an A here, it means you earned that A, all right? And you will have some very nice people who will have no problem giving you a C if you don't earn that C. So you want to really work hard, and I know you will. I have no doubt you will be passionate about the work. You will build relationships. You will get beyond your comfort zone. You will learn how to listen and think critically. You will do all those things. And so I encourage you to get involved and to see what a difference it will make. I finally want to talk about freedom of choice. You go from being high school boys and girls to college men and women. I spoke at several of your high school commencements. At that time, you were still high school kids. Today, you are young adults. You have many opportunities to make choices. And I want to talk about the type of choice that's really important. You have the freedom, more freedom than ever before, and the choices you make will make a big difference in your lives. It should concern us all that 1,400 college students die each year from binge drinking. 1,400, that means 100 deaths per month, three college students die per day. We never think of young people as dying, and yet here we are with students dying because of binge drinking already this year. In the past few days, we have had a number of problems with alcohol among new students. 
the challenge that you face is to know when to say no and to know the importance of the fact that, quite frankly, it is illegal to drink if you're not 21. Now, let me say this to you. Four years ago, at on the morning of convocation, I found out that one of our freshmen had been rushed to the hospital the night before, having been found unconscious and lying in the dirt after drinking 10 shots of alcohol in a half an hour. If his friends had not gotten him to the hospital, he would have died. That's how serious this is. In high school, you have people laughing about the idea of drinking, but what I'm telling you is three people every day in this country die. And so what is my message to you? You have the ability to think critically. You have the ability to make decisions about how you do whatever you do, when you do it, how much of it you do it, all those issues. And I hope that you will use your education here to prepare for life in such a way that you do things that your parents will be proud of things that you'll be proud of in years to come. Doesn't mean you can't have fun. You can have plenty of fun. We want you to have fun, but we want you to be healthy. It's very important. My students yesterday asked me to close or to say something about a story, and I do want to say something about a story involving a student I've talked about to some of you before. A few months ago, we had a ceremony in, in this room, an event for Jamie. Jamie Hurd, and you can read about him on the web. Jamie was a brilliant young student, very smart young man, majoring in biology and philosophy, who had a great attitude about life. And amazingly, his mother died before he was 13. He had type 1 diabetes, and yet he always had this very positive attitude. And he'd go around to people and say, what's your philosophy of life? What's your purpose in life? And people would tease him and call him Dr. Bowski Jr. <laughs> because I'm always asking people, what are you planning to do, right? And all of a sudden, he was playing soccer one night, and he never woke up. Before he was 21, he was dead. And yet, he had written on Facebook his purpose of life. And I want to read it to you as a kind of credo, a kind of statement about the possibilities of living the good life in a short period of time. He entitled it, of all things, Life is Beautiful. In spite of all the tragedies, he still was determined to have a really great attitude. And he said this, I value life because I realize that too many people waste it. I smile because I realize that too many people cry. I laugh because I know too many people take things too seriously. I teach because so many people are ignorant, and I speak because people need to listen, but I listen because so many people have been ignored. I have fun because too many people are always busy. I live for a purpose because too many people have died for no purpose. I love because too many people show hate. I keep trying because too many people give up. I appreciate what I have because so many people take it for granted. Life is beautiful. I encourage you to embrace that passion for life, that passion for education, and begin your journey today. Welcome to UMBC, all new students. We're proud of you. It's now my pleasure. If you want to read my whole talk, it's on the web, but I wanted just to talk to you a few minutes. By the way, let me say this to you. You all are so impressive because you've been listening to people talk. It's warm in here. Give yourselves a hand for being an impressive group of young people. And with that, I'm introducing Dr. Nancy Young, who's been here 20 years helping to support students. She is our Vice President for Student Affairs, and a lot of the areas you're involved with, she is responsible for. Dr. Young. Thank you, Dr. Hrabowski. And new students, I am pleased to tell you that we have arrived at the point of our ceremony where we formally welcome you as full members of UMBC's intellectual community. Faculty, staff, and returning students take great joy in this part of the ceremony because we welcome you not only to our intellectual community, but to a sort of extended family. As you entered the rack today, 
Each of you were given a paw, a little pin, and a symbol. This pin is in the shape of the paw of a retriever, our UMBC mascot. But this pin not only represents the physical paw, but is a symbol of much, much more. The paw is a symbol of our commitment to you, our commitment to support your goals and your dreams, our commitment to help you succeed during your four or perhaps five years here. It is also a symbol of our, your commitment to the responsibilities and expectations that you accept as you enter UMBC's community. Since applying for admission to UMBC, each of you has demonstrated the prerequisite qualifications and academic preparation necessary to excel. That's why we admitted you. It's why you chose to be here. But since then, you have attended orientation, registered for classes, perhaps moved in, or attended the commuter ropes course and retreat. More recently, you joined us for the Welcome Week activities, designed not only to help with your transition, but to transmit our community's traditions, values, and expectations. Through these activities, you have learned that UMBC is a community whose members strive to promote academic excellence, a community where each of us is expected to um, engage responsibly in civic activity, to take action to improve the community we now share. You have learned that UMBC is a place where all members are welcome and treated with dignity and respect. And you have learned that members of this community conduct themselves with in all integrity in all matters, both inside and outside of the classroom. You have learned that the key to academic and personal success is active and full engagement, both in curricular and co-curricular activities. Through their convocation speeches, campus leaders have today reaffirmed and shared their commitment to these values and expectations. Therefore, the pin that you now hold in your hand or have shoved in your pocket and soon will take out serves always as a reminder of the words you heard today. A reminder that UMBC is a place where we value the life of the mind and where all members are valued and encouraged to participate in both our campus and the larger community that surrounds us. Having learned of our values, our traditions and expectations, and having indicated your desire to join this community by attending this ceremony today, there is only one joyous thing remaining for us to do. I will now ask Dr. Hrabowski to rejoin me for our convocation tradition, the pinning ceremony. Yeah. And immediately following, you will learn and join us in singing our alma mater. But first, students, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I want you to think about the fact that by accepting this retriever pin, that you pledge to make the most of your education while striving to uphold UMBC's highest ideals. New students, remaining somewhat silent as you rise, please stand to accept this pledge while holding in your hands the pin you received as you entered the Retriever Activity Center. <laughs> Dr. Hrabowski, faculty, staff, and the students, returners, the Woolies, the student leaders, the commuter assistants that are here, I have the honor of presenting the entering class for fall 2008 and ask you to join me in recognizing them as full members of our UMBC community with all rights and, uh, rights and privileges <laughs> associated with this membership. In recognition of your support, Will the faculty, staff, and upper class students now stand and face our students, our new students, as they begin to pin themselves? Students, today we honor each of you and remind you that you are now and forever a part of the larger UMBC community, not only on campus, but throughout Maryland, the country, and the world. I now invite you to proudly place the pin that we gave you on arrival on your shirt. Let's see. No.
no one can go without a pin. Please come right up here, an informal part of our ceremony. This is how we take care of each other at UMBC. We are delighted to welcome you, and we ask that you now remain standing while our group of talented students leads us in our alma mater. You will find the words on your yellow program that you brought as you arrived. And students, when you come to games and, and the alma mater is, is being sung and others are walking, make sure you remind them to stand and not to walk. When we are singing the alma mater, it's very important. Out of respect for the university and for ourselves, we always remain standing. Students, I want you to look at the student to your left and look at the student to your right. Our goal is to make sure all of you walk across the stage as UMBC graduates. Give yourselves a hand. Just know that we care and we're here. We know you will do your best. Following today's ceremony, you are invited to a celebration outside. Uh, please come and join us and have a good time. Welcome to UMBC. One more round of applause. Please remain standing until we march out. Please remain standing, everyone. Ms. Hill, help everybody remain standing until we proceed. <laughs> 